Okay, hello everyone. My name is Ron Donner. I'm the editor of Aircraft Maintenance Technology Magazine. And uh, with me today we have uh, three leaders in the uh, business aviation, uh, FBO and MRO business. So I'd like to introduce each one of them here and uh, you can say a few words. Uh, and Rich, we'll start with you. Good afternoon. My name is Rich Bader. I'm the Vice President General Manager of L8 Aviation in Moline, Illinois, uh, also known as the Quad Cities. We're a uh, full-service MRO facility that uh, nose-to-tail services and support for uh, turboprop and uh, corporate aviation jet aircraft. Thank you, Rich. Uh, next, we have Chad Doring from Duncan Aviation. Hi, uh, Chad Doring uh, with Duncan. I've been with Duncan for about 18 years. I'm the manager of the airframe shop. There's currently about uh, 200 employees in the airframe shop, A&P mechanics along with uh, technical uh, experts. Uh, we have our main facilities in Lincoln, Nebraska. We also have a sister facility in Battle Creek, Michigan, and Provo, Utah, uh, with multiple avionics satellite shops across uh, the country in major cities, uh, as well as engine rapid response teams. Thank you. Thanks, Chad. And next is uh, Vinny Vendito from uh, Jet Aviation St. Louis. Good morning, as he said. Uh, uh, Vinny Vendito from uh, Jet Aviation in St. Louis. Uh, I've been there just about uh, 18 years now. I'm the uh, MRO avionics manager there. Um, was on the floor for about nine years and then moved into the uh, management spot up there. So uh, full service MRO refurb and completion center. Uh, I've always been on the MRO side of the business, though, so thank you. Well, thanks for uh, joining us, gentlemen. Uh, and what we wanted to do today is just have an open discussion about some of the uh, challenges uh, facing this uh, business today. Uh, and we'll just uh, start right out here. And uh, certainly, if anybody has any questions before or during or after, uh, let us know. So I'll start with you, Rich. <clears throat> now you manage multiple FBOs and MROs around the Midwest, uh, and there must be a lot of challenges that go with that. So what would you say are your top one or two challenges? You know, what keeps you up at night when it comes to managing this sort of a business? Well, a couple things come to mind. You know, standardization relative to the products and services you deliver or a consistent challenge and uh, part of that involves the, the challenge of making sure we have good effective communication within our organization and with our clients and with the vendors that we use. Um, in a lot of circumstances with multiple sites you're dealing with different FISDOs and different interpretations of the regulatory requirements that we have to deal with so unless we have uh, a CMU setup which is a certificate management unit where there's one interpretation with multiple sites, we're dealing with multiple interpretations, and that creates another standardization issue that uh, challenges the uh, the MROs and FBOs to uh, deliver what we need to do to our clients. That's an interesting point, and I, I think we'll come back to that a little bit later on. So, uh, Chad, how about you on, the, uh, on your side at Duncan? What would you say are your biggest challenges? What keeps you up at night? Just much like Rich is... Um, standardization uh, between between facilities between airframe departments or, or any department uh, along with resource allocation some of our big capital uh, tooling items uh, sharing those items and uh, making sure that we're scheduling those items between facilities is, is uh, can be quite cumbersome sometimes um, as well but also uh, processes and procedures and making sure we have the consistent process and procedures in both locations, which requires a lot of interaction between uh, myself and my counterpart in Battle Creek, Michigan, uh, as well as Provo. So we have to do a lot of talking, and when we implement a process and procedure, we do it as a team. And we, we go through the minutia as a team, through the process, and approve it, and so forth, to make sure we have good, consistent measures. Yeah, much the same. So, Vinny, uh, you see the same same sort of aspects at uh, Jet Aviation? Well, yeah, I mean, with, with multiple locations, you're obviously 
your number, our number one goal is sales and backlog, keeping all of the locations busy all the time. And that's, you talk about keeping you up at night, that, that'll do it. If you, if you don't keep everybody busy, we're not doing our job. So along with everything else these guys are saying, standardization processes, uh, things like that, that's, those are key things that we have to do managing multiple locations. You, you, I'm sure everybody knows, I mean, you have multiple locations, you have different skill sets at every location and trying to maintain that same level of customer service and, and proficiency throughout those locations, it's, it's, it's tough to do. It's, it's, a, it's no small task. So maybe I'll move right in and, and ask you, Vinny, so <clears throat> what are some of your company's best practices that you use to overcome some of these challenges? You have to you have to put the right leadership in place. If you don't have the leadership in place to to instill these uh, best practices, to instill the procedures and the processes and things like that, to to maintain that sale sales and backlog, uh, you, you got to have one sales force selling for all locations and and to try to instead of instead of competing against yourself or your different locations, one sales force selling for all locations is, is one of our main hmm. items, I think. How about you, Chad? What are some of your best practices? I agree with Benny. It, the, it, it starts at sales, and, and one sales force working uh, uh, united to, to fill all the locations is key. Um, also, you know, with our, our best practices, we have one consistent practice for all facilities. Um, and then the, it gets back into leadership to implement that best practice to uh, hold accountable and responsible to uh, achieve that what that best practices intent is. So it really does boil down to leadership and it's the leadership ship team has to work just that as a team. So Rich, uh, along those same lines, you know, what are some of the lessons learned, I guess? What can you share uh, with regards to, you know, lessons that you've learned managing multiple locations? Well, going back what these two gentlemen said, uh, two key words there are leadership and sales. You know, if we don't have a backlog, uh, labor spoils instantaneously, and you, there's no, no opportunity to go back and, and resell that. It's just gone. So, you know, having a, a solid backlog, which is uh, driven by the sales team, is uh, a real challenge. Uh, leadership is critical relative to overcoming uh, a lot of these challenges because the vision has to be communicated, the expectation has to be set from the very top. And then throughout the organization, that, that message has to uh, be carried through on a continuous basis. And then your high potential employees throughout the organization need to be identified and their knowledge and their talent needs to be tapped into to help overcome the issues that, that arise, and they arise every day. So we have to be able to respect our peers uh, within each location. We have to have respect for our peers at the opposite locations, be open-minded and willing to learn from each of those folks because there's a lot of wisdom in our facilities, but it's, it may be, like Vinny said, you got a certain amount of uh, wisdom and capability over here, but it's maybe a little bit stronger over there, and we have to be able to recognize that, value it, and be open-minded to learning from each other. Hmm. All good points. Uh, let's move the discussion a little bit more technical. You know, there's two, uh, two pieces of uh, the work that we do that seem to be uh, very active today. And, and you see a lot said about them, and, and that's the concept of the mobile maintenance unit. And the other one is uh, something that's more uh, a, a lot to do with what Vinny does is avionics and electronics, and, and more so cabin communications in these aircraft seem to be something that's uh, become very, very important to customers. So maybe we'll just start out with the mobile maintenance units. Uh, uh, Rich, does your company at Elliott, do you, uh, do you have any of these mobile units around the country outside of your uh, key locations at all? Currently we do not. We dispatch from the sites that we have. Okay. And how about a jet? Oh. Yeah, as a matter of fact, um, 
also, like Rich was saying, we will dispatch from our locations, but we just recently uh, deployed a mobile maintenance team uh, to the West Palm Beach area and try to service the, the customers and, and airframes in that region, so to speak, so many mile radius at, at any point in time. They're obviously armed with equipment and as much as they can and, and computer uh, IT, all, all the basic essential tools that they could have and, you know, trying to drum up business and do what we can for customers in that area. We'll so is that is that mobile team then managed out of your St. Louis facility? Yes. As a matter of fact, all everything funnels back to us at, from St. Louis area. Um, keep in contact back and forth with us all the time. Okay. If it you know if it pans out, we you know may even move to different locations too. We'll see how it goes. But okay. it's a key. I mean, customers today are customers want you to come to them instead of them coming to you. I mean, with the prices of fuel and things like that, it's it's so much more economical for the for the end customer to to be serviced at his facility versus bringing it up here. Chad, what do you guys do at Duncan? Uh, as I said before, we have rapid response teams, and they're engine rapid response teams in eight locations um, across the United States. We also dispatch out of Lincoln and Battle Creek, Michigan, uh, for airframe. The engine rapid response is key. Uh, those guys are equipped um, to basic to remove an engine off the pylon, um, or do troubleshooting, or on the pylon repairs as well. Rap, rapid response mobile teams are the wave of the future. As Vinny indicated, it, it's becoming uh, very critical to our customers to go to their location, fix airplanes because of the fuel cost, the operating cost, the airplane, and convenience. Um, so we have to reach out to them. We are, we're looking right now currently about putting uh, airframe technicians in rapid response locations as well as coming up with a full uh, mobile or rapid response program from the airframe perspective doing inspections on the road uh, in customers facilities and so forth so it's it's an increasing growing part of our uh, our business thank you thank you so we'll talk about uh, cabin communications uh, last fall as an example when I attended the NBAA uh, convention it was obvious that <laughs> Wi-Fi communications, telephone, you name it, in the cabin of these business use aircraft is something that's very important to the owner. So, uh, Vinny, I'll start with you. I think you've got some, some experience in that area. So, you know, what do you see? What are the trends uh, with regards to that? And, and what is that, how does that impact your workforce? What does that all look like in the maintenance arena? Well, I mean, it's obviously the wave of the future. It's it's been the wave for several years now. But you know, Wi-Fi and telecommunications, all of that stuff in the cabin is is really all all that CEO cares about anymore. It, you talk about the engines and stuff. He doesn't care. Hey, he does, but he really he wants to make sure he can get on his BlackBerry or his laptop, and he wants to be able to communicate like that, just like he would from his office. That's that's really what's been. A, a key part of our avionics business these days is has been the the cabin and, and that that sort of thing so it's huge it's huge right now so you see the same thing chad at, at duncan absolutely uh wi-fi is is a big deal and um also as far as the entertainment systems uh touch touch button controls that control everything uh in the cabin heat it lights uh, as well as audio visual equipment so it, it's a big deal Vinny Vinny's the expert in that area um, but uh, you're right the, the the boss doesn't care how the airplanes flying or what's how it's pro, uh, propelled they really want to make sure that iPods working yeah. in that airplane so oh, yeah. and and as that technology continues to change and evolve at such a rapid pace as we all know uh, it, it seems to me that there's there's a uh, could be a constant flow of upgrading systems as as new technologies change. Rich, what do you see uh, with regards to that uh, kind of constant change of technology in the cabins? 
Well, what we're seeing, we're we're seeing a lot of what these gar, guys are. You know, the the CEOs want to you know, have an office in the sky. They want to use their iPads, their cell phones. They don't want to see any difference between how things work for them with the tools they have in the air uh, any any differently than it is on the ground. So we we see a lot of pressure for that. You know, the evolution of the uh, the commercial electronics, the PC technology, has really changed the way aviation. Uh, works these days. Uh, you know the the cockpits are completely different. Uh, the the steam gauges, the mechanical gauges that many of the aircraft were developed, certified, and delivered with uh, back through the 80s and into the early 90s just doesn't exist anymore. And so the traditional avionics shops are are going away, and as as that technology evolves. And so with that, we're seeing a lot of the the cockpits being retrofitted from all mechanical gauges to nothing but pure flat screens and uh, there's a variety of, uh, uh, of OEMs that provide alternatives to that and the price point is dropping and uh, that technology is a lot more available to uh, uh, what I would consider to be more entry-level aircraft than ever before. We're beginning to see quite a bit of that uh, and a large part of our backlog at uh, L8 Aviation is built on that. Mm, interesting. Well just to add one more thing on that Ron, I mean you <laughs> You talk about, you know, like you said, the old steam gauges and things like that are, are a thing of the past. More and more of this uh, computer age office in the sky stuff is, is what is needed now. And that's all part of what we have to structure our, our technicians and workforce. It's not so much an avionics shop anymore. You've got an IT shop that really has to, if they're not IT savvy, they're a thing of the, I mean, it's just not that helpful anymore. I mean, yeah. Power and ground is one thing, but you, you got to be able to configure, you know, software and all that kind of stuff nowadays. It's, it's all code. It's all, yeah, yeah. exactly. Well, that's an that's interesting point. We're going to talk in a few minutes about uh, the technician uh, workforce here, so we'll, we'll have a little bit more to come on that. So at this show, as you can look around and you see, there's a lot of equipment, tooling, ground sport equipment, fuel trucks, you name it. So uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the challenges, and I think I already heard it here with moving equipment around and, and uh, such from one facility to another. So, Rich, maybe I'll just start with you. So uh, with multiple facilities, uh, you must face some uh, challenges there with both acquiring equipment, ground support equipment, tooling, and then and then planning for it uh, for certain maintenance events and perhaps even moving it around to locations. You know, what are some of your uh, challenges and, and lessons that you've learned with regard to that? Well, you know, the airline business is a, a high cost, high risk, low margin business, so the the number one challenge we face is justifying what we need uh, with the CFO and getting those dollars approved to buy what we need to do our work with. That's a real challenge and when you have multiple occasions or locations, you know, uh, in, our, in our case that's times three for everything you need essentially and uh, it just compounds the problem and so it gets to be really hard to justify uh, some of the equipment you see around here because it's not cheap. Uh, it's necessary and it's good stuff and you have to have it but it's it's not inexpensive and so the challenge is to justify that uh, explain what the return on investment is going to be so you can get uh, the authorization to buy this stuff hmm. so uh, Chad maybe to you so just planning the movement of equipment around for some heavy phase inspections at one facility to another you know, we think about maintenance planning, but certainly having the right tools and equipment to coincide with those uh, big maintenance events are, are uh, part of the whole maintenance planning process. Can you speak to that a little bit? Sure. Um, I can give you a good example. We have a uh, set of dummy gear that we made for a Falcon and a Challenger. And uh, it's very expensive, very heavy equipment. Both in each of our, our Battle Creek and our Lincoln facility needs that equipment. Um, what happens is our diversity sometimes uh, hurts us in, in our equipment and having multiple capabilities in, in both locations, that need for that equipment comes at the same time uh, quite often. I have one person that, that 
schedules the work into the shop, but also schedules these resources, this 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 tooling, this landing gear, this dummy landing gear, and uh, we're shipping this gear back and forth. We've now determined that um, <clears throat> we need to build another set of this landing gear, and it comes at about seventy-five thousand dollars. So, much like Rich said, this is very very costly equipment. You times it by three or times it by two, and uh, but you do that when that appropriate time is, when that need is there. So that's where we have to, as a management team, have to keep looking at that and determine, okay, what is our cost point of shipping back and forth and customer displacement to where we need to build another set of gear or buy another piece of equipment. So how about you, Vinny? You have anything to add there? Well, I mean, I, I hate to sound like it's an echo in here. Yeah. But, I mean, <laughs> it, it really is. It comes down to expense. I mean, it's... It, the stuff is you, you have to you have to try to budget for it but you have to pick and choose exactly what you're going to specialize in at your certain locations because you you can't do everything everywhere it's just you can try but you're going to spend a ton of money so i guess in essence you if you pick and choose what you can specialize in certain areas if you can explore the uh, opportunity maybe to uh, rent specialized equipment uh, on occasion if you only need it on a uh, you know once in a great while um, but then you know you're you're obviously got to absorb that cost somehow or pass that on to the end user and that's that's a hard thing to do too because he doesn't want to pay that sure it's sure. just it's it's expensive <laughs> You know, we talked, uh, already heard a little bit about consistent application of policies and procedures and how that uh, works with multiple facilities. So, you know, maybe we can just elaborate a little bit on that. So, uh, and I'll start with you, Rich. So specifically, you know, what kind of sort of technician, uh, techniques, excuse me, does your, do you employ, you know, regarding the managing of consistent quality standards and maintenance practices throughout your uh, system? Well, two things come to mind. Uh, one is good communication. The other one is documentation. Uh, again, if you get everybody bought into the idea of working together to identify what the best practice or the best way of accomplishing a job is, and then documenting that and putting that in a medium where it's easily accessible to them, where they can use it, uh, then that will create standardization, that will create efficiency. Um, but again, it goes back to uh, leadership, uh, establishing expectation, uh, driving the message down, and uh, it, it's good teamwork and respect of each other to be, be able to be open-minded enough to, to learn from uh, your mistakes, learn from your opportunities, uh, put those documents in place, and then use them. So, Chad, uh uh, at your uh, company, along those same lines, you know, standardization and of policies and of practices. So maybe would you like to talk a little bit about what role uh, IT information technology and and uh, such plays? Uh, are all your facilities connected to the same network, and how does all that work? Sure, um, we're very fortunate at Duncan to have our own IT department. We do a lot of um, our own in-house programming. We've, we've built and designed a work order system that's used in all of our locations, all of our, our 20 avionics satellite shops, our Battle Creek, Michigan, Lincoln, and Provo facilities. It's all under one work order system, which is all paperless. It's in the computer. Um, it took years to develop this, and it's a continual process that we're developing. But it, it, that, that is our central point for the work order system. So we can go in and retrieve documentation very easily and uh, very readily. It, multiple points can go in there and look at that same documentation simultaneously. Our IT department also has played a huge role in our customer communication, uh, developing a, a web-based program that the customers now, it's a portal into the, into the company to follow their project along to approve items that, uh, that we find wrong and um, to get status updates, financial updates, things like that. So the IT portion of this industry is growing. And where we see it also growing is in, in the maintenance end of it, as far as our technicians. Um, iPads, it's gonna be a wave of the future. A lot of our manufacturers are now putting their maintenance manuals as an app. 
um, Embraer I can think of right now, it's, it's in an app form. So we can see where the iPad is going to start taking uh, a bigger foothold within our industry, not only for our work order documentation, but for our maintenance manual criteria as well. So we got to keep looking uh, for the future. You know, but the session before was about media and blogging and and, and so forth. Um, we we have to be cognizant of that with the generation that's coming behind us because that's a huge part of that. Thank you, Vinny. How about uh, your organization down at uh, Jet Aviation, you know, what role does information technology play in, in your maintenance group? Well, the, the IT industry, I mean, if you're fortunate enough to have a good IT department, uh, it's, it's absolutely incredible. I mean, it's such a huge uh, aspect of the work, uh, work scope these days. You've got to have, you've got to have it at multiple locations. Like Chad saying, it, all under one work order system, you've got to be able to manage and maintain that uh, through one through one system. And if if you've got a good IT department, it's going to be that's going to be another huge expense also. But it's well worth it. It's well worth the money. So, um, I, yeah, it's I don't know what else to say there, that, but that's that's fine. So, Rich, back to you. I, I heard you already mention a little bit about. Uh, uh, relationships with the FAA. Let's talk a little bit about the regulatory side and and with with maintenance organizations around the country. Uh, you know, uh, what can you talk to us about? You know, with FAA relationships and kind of the regulatory compliance piece that goes with multiple locations. Well, again, if uh, you have multiple locations and you're you're not privileged to have a CMU or certificate management management unit uh, part of your organization, then you're dealing with uh, multiple FISDOs that uh, potentially can have different interpretations of regulatory requirements that you're you're held to. And so, uh, if that's the case, then each site that you have has to work very hard to establish a relationship and a relationship built on trust with the gentlemen or the ladies at the, in the FISDO that they rely on to provide guidance and approvals uh, for the work that we do. So again, uh, a large part of this, this industry in all aspects is built on relationships. Relationships with the employees, relationships with clients, relationships with vendors, OEMs, and, and the FAA is a big part of the team that makes this all work. And we have to respect that and work, work hard to work with them. So how about down at Duncan? Now, do you does your uh, network also have the certificate management unit uh, concept as as uh, Riches does? We do, yes, and and Rich is exactly right. the The CMU is a centralized um, FA entity, so it, it's nice not having to to deal with the different FISDOs and the different uh, uh, aspects that. Each, each FISDO brings in. So under a CMU, we can work uh, more centralized. Is that? Sure, yeah. sure. And JET, I know JET's got locations, well, all over the world, I guess. Uh, yeah, we. I mean, but to even elaborate, we just recently went through that. They, uh, The FAA kind of realigned us during the uh, Mid-Coast Jet Aviation transformation for whatever, for what have you. But uh, we worked for years out of the Wichita office and then they said no wait a minute you guys are actually in Illinois not St. Louis so now we had to go to the Chicago office and after working for years and 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 <coughs> establishing relationships with Wichita now we had to you know work with Chicago and it's it's unbelievable how much differences there can be within a standardization uh, FA you know office it's and that's it. You like know, you said, establishing relationships, though, is key. You have for, to do For that. years and years, I think, you could probably say, unfortunately, but we, we've all hear that no matter what segment of aviation you're in, it's the, it's the differences of interpretation right. from one uh, geographic uh, office to another. So, so really, it sounds like the, the certificate management unit concept for the kind of business you guys are in really has is, is, is been a good benefit there. Is that... I would say it has, yeah. Great, great. So, uh, 
I'll we'll talk a little bit about SMS, uh, you know, safety management systems in the, in the maintenance organization. So, uh, uh, Rich, what have you guys done? Have you implemented a, a specific SMS program uh, in your organization yet, or what sort of what sort of programs do you have? Uh, we do have a formalized SMS program for flight management and charter business. Uh, and that SMS program is developed and it's managed out of our Flying Cloud Minnesota facility. Uh, relative to PAR 145 MRO operations, we don't have a formal SMS program in place as such, but we do have a safety program, safety director, and uh, all that goes with that. So uh, when the regulatory requirement comes down that we have to have an SMS program for PAR 145, I believe we're already there. A uh, large part of that is, is tying the SMS program or the safety program to your quality management system. And uh, so to help do that in Moline, we are an ISO 9000 uh, certified organization. Oh, okay. And it, it really kind of pulls the whole thing all together and holds us to a higher standard. Sure, absolutely. How about you, Chad? Yeah, much like Elliot's, we're, uh, our flight operations is uh, a fully implemented SMS program. Um, our 145 side, uh, the repair side of it, um, we're, we're right there. We have the processes and procedures, we have the safety programs in place, the quality management system that's in place as well. Um, and, and just to reiterate what Rich said, once that, that regulation comes down, we're, we're ready to uh, fully comply with that as well. Sure. So it sounds like it sounds like one of the one of the best practices, if you will, that you've already been establishing is to is to move that program into your maintenance organization well before it becomes a regulatory requirement. Right. How about you, Vinny? What are you guys doing? Well, s safety is the number one objective of Jet Aviation today. I mean, without a doubt, every day, every morning. We, we have the daily roll-up meetings from the guys on the floor all the way up to the executive office, and the number one topic at every level is safety. What, what safety issues do you have today? Are there any concerns? Are there any issues? Uh, whatever, whatever the case may be. We have safety officers. We have a safety committee. We, we meet you know, twice a month reviewing those different suggestions and opportunities and, and and address, make sure everything is addressed and, and safe. Like I said, safety is the absolute number one goal within jet aviation today. So, let's move uh, <clears throat> move into another uh, subject. Of course, that's pretty uh, near and dear to all of us. And let's talk about the hiring and retaining uh, our technician workforce. I mean, we all clearly understand. Uh, the need for technicians in the future and uh, I mean let's face it uh, probably the average age of the technician on the floor today is is probably someone close to my age or our ages and you know where the where's the next generation uh, coming from so you know I, to start out with are you guys hiring technicians today yeah, Elliott Aviation is hiring we've added 40 new positions over the past year and we're continuing to grow and and add and uh, to further answer your question uh, I think if there is any one number one challenge that we're faced with at least from my perspective right now is being able to find and attract uh, quality individuals that are technically oriented or mechanically inclined into our industry you know over the past two to three years with the economic downturn uh, there, unfortunately, with our industry as well as many others, uh, a lot of folks have had to be let go. And uh, it, conventional wisdom would indicate that there's a lot of folks out there looking for work that you can go attract and hire and, and put to work immediately with some, some experience. But we're finding that is absolutely not the case, and it's extremely difficult to, to hire and attract folks uh, with any kind of experience these days. I've uh, been in this business now since 1977, and I've been involved in, in hiring and making hiring decisions for many years. And uh, from my perspective, I don't think I've ever seen it as difficult as it is right now to find a, a good, experienced A&P or technician. Wow. it's interesting. How about you guys, uh, Duncan? Yeah, we are hiring. Um, 
we're in a growth pattern right now, which is which is nice. Uh, three years ago, or even as, as much as a year ago, we couldn't say that. Um, we've hired uh, over 25 airframe technicians in the last six months. Um, much like what Rich said, it's it's finding that good that good technical sense uh, from a person, but also character. And we're looking for uh, an employee that can bring a lot to the organization as far as character and and um, and morale. Who can? Because what we've found is that that person can really take care of our customers uh, the best. And and building relationships with our customers is, is very key. We we encourage our employees to do that. So. Um, Finding people with that, those skill sets are becoming very hard to find, and um, and the younger generation is is tends to um, be more interested in what's in it for themselves versus what can I do for the company. So we're we're having a hard time trying to find those types of people. You know, you mentioned a little while ago, uh, Vinny, about we were talking about IT and uh, cabin communications, and uh, you even uh, used the phrase about how the avionics shop isn't really avionics anymore as much as it is an IT shop. So, <clears throat> so what really, what, what do you look for? What do, what do you need as far as skills in uh, technicians today? Well, I mean, even putting skill sets aside and, and talent aside, it's, it's dedication, it's commitment, and it's passion for, for the job. I mean, for, for what you do, you got to want to come to work. You got to want to, you got to like your job. You got to love your job. I mean, you want to be dedicated to your work. I mean, it's, it's really, really tough to find qualified individuals right now. We do a lot of contract for hire is when we when we uh, look for employees now it's it's almost like a 90 day probationary period with these contractors let's see how you do for a while if you do all right maybe we'll bring you on um, but like I said the skill set aside what what I look for the most is like you said what can you do for the company versus you know, these, like some of the kids today, they want to, it's all about them and me and what are you going to give me? Well, what are you, what are you going to do for, for us and our, and our company? So if you're, if you're a kid coming out of grad school or, or A&P school or whatever, it's, it's, it's dedication, it's commitment to the job. That's what, that's what I look for. So the, the message is kind of the same across the board here is, is he can learn the skill. He, he can be taught the skill, but it's the attitude and the and, and yeah. the right right frame you, of mind that you need. Obviously, you've got to have a certain skill set. You've got to have a certain level. But if if you're committed and you're dedicated and you're willing, we can train that person and he'll pick it up and he'll go with it. Hmm. But if somebody just sitting back and waits for everything to come to them, it it won't happen. So what about uh, so, so what what kind of programs? I guess is maybe the best word. What do we? What do you your companies do right now as far as far as hiring goes? Do you you know do you go to A and P schools? Do you have job fairs or, or you know how do you go out and recruit people, Rich? Well, it's got to be a multifaceted approach, and like these gentlemen just said, yeah, priority one for us is hiring for quality of character. You can teach someone uh, essentially the technical parts if they're inclined to do that, but what you can't teach them is to have integrity, honesty, uh, a work ethic, and to be a good team player. And so, again, for us, that's what we need, and that's what we look for. But from a recruiting standpoint, uh, we put together last year a, a strategic recruiting plan that's uh, uh, multifaceted so that we can uh, uh, search for and recruit and hire from a, a variety of different locations. We do develop relationships with A&P schools. We do involve ourselves uh, within those schools as advisory board members to the best of our ability. Uh, we do look within the community. There are a lot of things that we can hire and, and put people to work for that quite honestly there, there aren't schools for. Uh, there is no school for painting an airplane. There is no school for doing an interior, well with one exception in Wyoming, uh, and a variety of things like that. So we do look within the community. We prefer to hire from within the community. Uh, that's important for us. Uh, and I think lastly, you know, uh, veterans, uh, those folks coming out of the military with uh, anywhere between four and ten years of experience on uh, uh, military aircraft, 
I think are a valuable asset, and uh, that's another venue that we work very hard at trying to recruit from. Hmm. Thanks. So, Chad, uh, another subject that comes up very often in in uh, in the maintenance arena today is is people get hired in as a mechanic, a technician. They're a hard worker. They want to do more, and you start looking for people that can be moved into supervisory or management positions and and there's a lot of discussion about that i know we even in our magazine had done some uh, webinars last year on moving into management positions so uh, you know what sort of practices do you do you employ what do you look for in your technical staff when it comes time to you know move somebody into supervisor's role well, all three of us on this panel are, are good uh, examples of starting as a technician level and, and working our way up into the, the leadership levels. Um, what we look for is uh, sometimes the best technicians, the most qualified technicians, don't make the best uh, leaders. And so what we look for is that right balance. Um, as, as our people progress into leadership positions and finding those people that have a good organizational skill set uh, along with a personable type person, um, that's that's the type of individual we're looking for in in our leadership. We promote very heavily within uh, in our leadership positions. Once we do identify that person, we we obviously go through a hiring process, but we also go through a training process as well, which does include some formal education, but a lot of on the job training, shadowing things of that nature and that's how we we train internally train our, our, our leaders within our company so uh, if any down at your company uh, you know what sort of uh, in addition to that what sort of internal uh, education and training programs do you provide uh, for these sort of candidates technicians that are moving up well, in the as, ranks as as Chad Chad said here, you could be the best technician in the world, but to move into a supervisory or a management spot doesn't always necessarily mean that's going to be, he's going to be at that same proficiency level. So, uh, and honestly, you know, in, in years past, Midcoast hasn't done, you know, the, the greatest job at doing that. They've taken the guys and said, okay, you're, you're an excellent technician. They put them in these supervisory roles and it's, it's really not the best fit, but you, you've got to you've got to be able to work with these guys if they want it you can work with them train them job shadow uh, continuing education um, all of those things are key leadership training classes uh, but to just take a guy off of the floor and put him in, in a management role or something like that doesn't always suit everybody's needs you, you almost set that person up for failure almost and that's the last thing we want to do because then everybody suffers so yeah and we've all uh, I, I think to a large degree we've probably all been there like yeah you said, we've all been there you're a good mechanic you're a good technician and next week you're going to be the supervisor but the main thing i think you want to do is you want to obviously give everybody a chance you you don't mm -hmm. want to limit that that group or anybody from saying no you can't apply so you want to give everybody a chance um, and having said that, I think if I was to estimate, I, I, from our management group and executive team at, at Midcoast slash Jet Aviation now, I would bet 75 to 80 percent of that core group came from the floor, technicians on the floor at one point in time. So. Oh, it's interesting. It's interesting. Well, certainly if anybody has any questions or comments they want to make about uh, about uh, you know what you've heard here today or have any questions for these gentlemen about what they do or uh, such feel free we're about ready to about ready to wrap things up I think uh, thanks um, how do you develop your relationships with the OEMs uh, and it appears in some cases that they would be direct competitors with you on on different uh, jobs so uh, they obviously own a lot of uh, knowledge and uh, a lot of the technical information and the parts and pieces that you're going to need. So uh, that seems like it would be a very delicate relationship. So how do you guys pull that little hat trick off? Uh, that's a good question. Rich, you want to start? Sure. Uh, 
that kind of defines our industry, uh, the essence of that question, because we're all competitors, but we're all business partners at the same time. We all do business with each other. We buy stuff from Duncan and Midcoast. We send things to Duncan to repair, and uh, we do the same with the OEM. So it's, it's, I always tell people it's kind of a love-hate relationship because we, we need each other, but we compete with each other all at the same time. I don't know if there are any other industries that, that have that, but it's, I think it's really unique to aviation and the, the MRO business that we're in. Uh, as far as the relationship goes, it has to be a, a conscious effort. You really have to make sure that uh, from a strategic standpoint, you understand who those key partners are that you need to pay attention to, and you make a point of reaching out to them and spending time with them and making sure that they understand what you're here to help them with and vice versa. It's got to be a very conscious effort. You know, it's an interesting point, and maybe, Chad, you can speak to this. Uh, probably all of your organizations are some sort of authorized OEM service center, and, and probably not by just one like Bombardier or, or, or Cessna or, or whatever, but multiples. Can you... Speak right. to that a little bit. Absolutely. Uh, you know, we're uh, Falcon, um, Hawker, Citation, Learjet Service Center. Um, and that's a great question, and, and Rich explained it very well. And, and part of that, part of what makes our organizations very good is that we can be a little more flexible sometimes. And so we can help the manufacturer out, the OEM out, on some, some areas that they're more rigid in. And so they, they recognize us for that as well as we recognize them for the support they have to provide to us and, and parts. So it's kind of a scratch your, you know, scratch each other's back uh, situation. But um, being, being a service center for all these different makes creates a lot of diversity. And, and like I said, that can create a lot of problems, but it also can be very good. Um, so we have to, we have people that really specialize in that program that that manufacturer and develop those relationships within those organizations so it's it's key it's paramount yeah we have we all have to work together I mean uh, at jet you know we're authorized service center for all the Bombardier products or globals and challengers and uh, uh, 850s um, we've recently become Gulfstream service center as of January 1st this year so that's going to be an interesting role to see how that pans out but it's it's like you said you know you, you scratch my back I'll scratch yours we have we provide customization and a, a different expertise in that area on certain you know product lines and individual items that we can offer that not necessarily Bombardier can't but they're working on an assembly line type thing, but it's where if they bring that customer to us, we can offer a little bit more customization for them or something or along those lines. So it's it's just working with each other. It's you know it's it's a delicate situation sometimes, but it's necessary evil, I guess. How you want to look at it? Yeah, from a service center standpoint, you know one of the one of the good ways to do this is to get engaged uh, with the OM. Uh, be a part of their their advisory groups. There's a tech committees. There's service center advisory boards, and a variety of ways to be involved. And that takes a commitment on our parts to do that because there's cost involved. Uh, but I think the three of us here in our organization see the value in that. And so as we try to provide value to our clients and our customers, we try to add value to the relationships we have at the OEM level too. Because sometimes we can see things that they can't. And so I think that's where that is important. Sure. Well, if nobody else has any questions or comments they want to make, I think we'll wrap it up. Uh, certainly, I want to thank uh, you gentlemen uh, sincerely for uh, coming and talking about this subject today. Rich from uh, Elliott Aviation, Chad from Duncan, and, and uh, Vinny from Jet Aviation in uh, St. Louis. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you all.